This happened in my junior year of high school. One evening, my mother and stepfather had gone out to some event. Maybe it was an extended dinner or a concert. I can't remember. I had stayed home to work on a paper that was due the next day and spent the whole night working at the desk in my room. To give you a picture of the room, my desk faces a wall and sits next to a small window that's on the same wall. And from where I sit, my back faces my doorway. While I was working, I was wearing these great headphones that I had gotten for my birthday, the kind that are noise canceling. My parents left the house around 6 p.m. and the whole time they were gone, I sat at my desk, blasting music through my headphones and writing my essay. Occasionally, I would take breaks and watch the rain and lightning outside my window. I never left my desk. My parents returned around 11 p.m. and at some point late in the evening, I had removed my headphones. So when my parents came home, which was coincidentally just a few minutes after I had taken off the headphones, I clearly heard the garage door open and my parents open the door to the house. Seconds after I hear them enter, I hear my mother shout my name. Adrian, she screams. What on earth happened in here? Confused, I get out of my chair and start walking through the house to them. There's only a small hallway that separates my room from the living room. Due to my rush to figure out why my mother was yelling, I paid little attention to the hall and the house. After a few moments, I get to my parents. My mom looks really upset. Was this you? Did you have friends over? I look down. The carpet is ruined. It's covered in muddy footprints. I frantically explain to her that I have no idea how those got there, that I had spent the whole night at my desk working on my paper. I watch as her face goes from anger to confusion to fear. We realize that someone else must have entered the house. Quickly, we scan the footprints, trying to make sense of the situation. It only takes us a few moments to figure out where they start. Our back door, which was usually left, unlocked. Then we noticed something else. The footprints started at the back door, but there were no footprints exiting the back door. We hear something pounding through our house. We hear the front door get torn open and then slammed shut. We all run into the garage and lock the door. My mom starts shouting at the police through the phone. Please come quickly. Someone has broken into our house. After what seems like hours, the police arrive. An officer stays with us in the garage as his partner goes through the house room by room. His partner tells us that it's safe to go back in, that there's no one in the house. Then she asks us a question. She asks us, whose room is down the hall to the left? My parents look at me and I tell the officer that it's mine she asks us to follow her down the hall. As we go, it's easy to see that the footprints weave through my house from the back door. They go through the living room, through the small hallway, into my parents' room, which is down the hall to the right, and then turn around towards my room, and then stop in my doorway. Then the officer points at my door, which I had left open the whole night, on it, in black sharpie, was written the following. 847, I see you. 853, you forgot to lock the back door. 859, you seem focused. 924, turn around. 947, look at me. 1015, look at me. 1037, look at me. 1049, look at me. For nearly two hours, 
someone stood in my doorway watching me. To this day, I shudder to think about what would have happened if I had ever turned around and looked at them. I was homeless for a few years after I turned 18. Being homeless leaves you with a permanent feeling of anxiousness and a sliver of fear buried within you at all times. You expect anything. The main problem I had with being homeless was sleeping. I was getting enough money from working side jobs to not have to worry about food or clothes, but finding a suitable place to sleep was difficult. You always had to keep in mind being detected. Sleeping in the woods was uncomfortable, but the odds of a cop waking you up and trespassing you are slim. I drifted around sleeping in unconventional and uncomfortable areas for quite some time before I discovered an abandoned church off a side road. The church was in pretty good condition and it was hidden off a side road so the odds of getting arrested for sleeping there were low. The pews were torn out and the stained glass windows were murky with dirt and dust. But there was a roof and four walls and it wasn't infested with animals, so it was heaven. I brought a sleeping bag and some blankets, and I slept there for about a week while I was trying to save up money to get an apartment for once. After a week of sleeping there, I came back to the church after a day of working and settled down in my sleeping bag, ready to go to sleep, when I heard the unmistakable sound of a piano. Two keys being hit repeatedly my pulse instantly skyrocketed, and I grabbed the knife I kept on me at all times. I didn't even know there was a piano in the church. I slowly got up with the knife in my hand and started packing my things up. I was getting the hell out of there. As I slung my backpack over my shoulder, the sound of the piano cut off and was replaced by the sound of a door creaking open. Slowly, I froze again and stared out towards the altar where the sound was coming from. It was dark, and I didn't want to turn on the flashlight on my phone. So I stood there breathing heavily while I was willing my eyes to adjust to the darkness. The door behind the altar was swinging open by itself. I tried opening it when I first discovered the church, but it was locked and I didn't want to break it down. The door was swinging open, and beyond the door was an even pitcher black than the one I was currently experiencing, and I turned towards the main doors, content on getting out before I saw any more. As I turned, I heard the sound of the door swinging open, be replaced by the sound of it slamming open violently, and suddenly, a plank of wood fell from the rafters in the ceiling and clattered loudly onto the floor, feet away from me. A groan like a mixture of a machine grinding to a halt and a man in pain emitted from the door behind me that slammed open and sent literal chills up my spine. I slammed my way out of the church and started running up the road. I looked behind me to see the front door slowly shut by themselves. I never returned. My story may not be the most interesting story you've ever heard. It doesn't end in me seeing a ghost or an alien or anything of that nature but it is real. Many years ago, I lived in Maine and would occasionally go camping by myself. On one of those occasions, I woke up late in the middle of the night at around 3 a.m. I was tossing and turning and couldn't sleep, so I just lay there, listening to the woods. Then I heard a faint, hello. I was petrified. I felt so vulnerable in that tent. I never figured out who it was.
The summer after I graduated from high school, I left work early and went up to my parents' cabin in northern Michigan. I spent the night at the beach watching the sunset. Once the sun went down and it became nearly pitch black, I got to my car and started driving down the highway. After a minute, there was an old Tahoe that started riding my tail and flashing its high beams. So I got up to about 60 in a 45, and they were still on my tail. I pulled off to the side road that my parents' cabin is off of, and they took the same turn. I thought this seemed weird, because there's only about 30 or 40 houses on this road. So I went all the way to the end, which is usually a dead end, but leads to a maintenance area for the golf course nearby. The truck was still following me. At this point, I was freaking out, because if I pulled into the house, they would know where we lived, and they were still very close behind me. I took a bunch of random turns, and the truck kept following every single turn for about 15 minutes. I finally had a chance to make a turn with traffic, going through the intersection that gave me a few seconds of a head start. I pulled down a side street, I went up about a hundred yards and then turned off all my lights and waited. The truck slowly drove by the perpendicular street and kept going. I booked it home, pulled my car around the side away from the main road and pulled every curtain in the cabin. For an 18 year old, I was scared as hell that night. Years ago, in the early 90s, my boyfriend was driving me home and we saw a man lying on the ground in the strangest position, kneeling with his head on the ground and bent at a sharp angle so that he faced the street. It was two in the morning and the man was covered in sweat with his eyes open. We pulled over and I hopped out of the car to check on this guy. His eyes were wide open and he seemed like his face wasn't moving, but it really felt like he was pleading for help. He didn't respond at all when called out to him. No blinking, he had glassy eyes. I reached out to touch him and he was ice cold. I'm sure he wasn't breathing. This was before cell phones, so I hopped back in the car and we sped back to my house to call 911. 10 minutes later, the police called back to ask for the cross streets again. Apparently, they arrived at the corner and there was nothing there. I verified that they had the right spot and they said they would call back if they needed any more information. That was the last I ever heard about it. I checked the newspaper for the next few weeks but we never found out anything else about that man in the road. This is a story that was told to me by my mother. She was home alone and was expecting a friend to come over. She wanted to take a shower, so she left a note on the front door that said, I'm in the shower come on in. While she was showering, she heard a knock on the bathroom door, and she said, I'll be right out. When she got out of the shower, nobody was there, and a few minutes later, her friend pulled into the driveway. I often visit Walmart in the wee hours of the morning. One time, I was in at about 2 a.m. and noticed an elderly gentleman asleep on one of those mobility scooters at the entrance. When I left about 20 minutes later, he was still there. I thought it was a little odd that no one from the store had woken him up. 
I found out the next day that he had died and spent the better part of a day on display as a corpse at the entrance to Walmart. I'm a massage therapist. I work for myself and frequently go to clients' homes at night. Whenever I would have a new client, I would bring my boyfriend with me as kind of backup. So the new client's condo was in a really nice area in Arizona. It was around 8 p.m. when I arrived. I got out of the truck and grabbed my bag and started looking for the apartment because this was one of those mega complexes and of course, the numbers were barely visible. As I was walking around, I noticed that every light I walked by would start flickering really quickly, like the light would be fine one minute, and as soon as I walked by it, it would start flickering. I felt like someone was watching me, but I shrugged it off and found the condo as quickly as possible. My session lasted about 90 minutes, and I packed up and headed back to the truck. Except, it wasn't in the spot that my boyfriend had parked in previously. So I call him, and he says that he's on his way, that something happened. I get in the truck when he arrives, and he is super pale, and his hands are shaking. I ask him what happened. He told me that as I was walking towards the apartments from the parking lot, he saw a girl behind me, walking in tandem with me, almost like a shadow. He said he put his head down to light his cigarette, and neither one of us were in his line of vision anymore. About halfway through his cigarette, he saw someone walk by the truck really quickly through the rearview mirror. He said it was the same girl. He was starting to feel a little freaked out, but nothing too bad. He said he turned on his headphones and leaned the seat back to take a nap, I guess, when he felt a thumping under his feet on the floorboard. He said he looked out into the parking lot and then saw the girl crawl out from under the hood of the truck, stand up, and then walk backwards away, looking at him the whole time, and then disappeared into the shadows of the opposite side of the parking lot awnings. So he peeled out and sat at the nearest gas station which was right next door for the rest of my appointment. I never went back to that particular client's home after that. A few years ago, I was awoken in the middle of the night by a phone call. I answered the phone and I heard a woman's voice on the other end, crying, and then she whispered, Help me. I looked at the screen, and the number was restricted. I heard more crying, and then a sudden scream. The scream was cut short, and the line disconnected. I've told this story to many people, and most of them say it was probably a prank call. I would have agreed, but the crying, it sounded so desperate, so real. I have no idea who it was. When I was a teen, I never had much of a rebellious side but my parents didn't want me in their bathroom when they weren't home. They had a fantastic shower as compared to the leaky piece of crap that I was stuck with. We'd had a minor spat this particular morning and they left to quote unquote, clear their heads. That meant it was time to use the fancy shower. I was alone and they had been gone about a half an hour. Then. I suddenly hear my dad stomp into the bedroom. He slammed his keys down, checked the answering machine, and I knew that he had to have been pissed, so I called out, 
My shower drain was leaking again. I'm sorry. I'll be out in a minute. And then, I heard him stomp over to the bathroom door and then stop. I called out to him and he starts jiggling and turning the handle like crazy. The weird thing is, the door wasn't locked. So I stepped out of the shower quickly and wrapped a towel around me and began saying, what the hell, as I opened the door. I opened it while it was in mid-shake, watching the knob turn, and there was no one on the other side when the door opened. I ran through the apartment and saw that we still had a message on the machine and the front door was still locked. My parents came home two hours later. I took in a puppy a few months ago. Her original owners weren't able to bond with her. They said that she was unresponsive and disobedient and didn't have the look that they wanted. I have no idea what they were talking about. She's the best behaved dog that I've ever known, and she's downright adorable. So I'm used to people stopping me in the street so they can pet her. Usually, people will ask before they touch her, or at the very least, they'll say something like, oh my gosh, look at that dog, to let me know that they're obviously gonna come over and say hi to her. I'm pretty much fine with that. What I'm not fine with is what happened on one of my earlier walks with her. I live in a tiny seaside town, and I like to take my dog on a tour of all the areas closest to the sea when I walk her. We'll walk along the beach, down the promenade, around the miniature lakes, and then back home. Probably not the smartest thing to do the same route every day, but I've switched things up since this happened. We were at the final stage of our walk one evening, making a couple laps around the lakes, when we walked past a man. Now a lot of old men gather there on a regular basis. I didn't think much of one dude sitting on a bench by the water. I told myself he was staring because my dog was cute. I just passed him by. Then, from behind me, I hear him say, Sit. And my dog, who is much more obedient than her previous owners let on, sits down and looks up at me all happy and expecting a treat. I turn around and frown back at the guy, and I see that he's still seated on the bench and quickly encourage my puppy to start walking again. We haven't gotten five feet further down the path before behind me I hear, sit, and my dog does. I turn around again, already glaring, and see that the man is now on his feet. I tell my dog to keep walking and try to get her to pick up the pace, trying to get over to the path that leads up to the main street. We're still nowhere near the path when the man yells, sit, and my dog does again. She's starting to look very confused, and I'm pretty much terrified at this point. He's coming over to us, and he's catching up fairly quickly. He's close enough that even without my glasses, I can tell that he's grinning. At that point, I had had enough. I forgot about getting to the path. I just scooped up my dog off the ground and ran straight up the hill to the side of us and climbed over the little fence that separates the lakes from the street. I looked down. The man didn't follow, but stayed at the bottom of the hill, looking up at us. He was not smiling anymore. I had never seen him before and haven't seen him since, and I really hope that it stays that way. I don't know exactly what his intentions were, but it seemed to me like he was using my dog's obedience to slow me down, to keep me from getting away from him. So I really doubt his intentions were good. I'm glad I didn't stick around to find out. A few winters ago, I got a job as a security guard. 
My responsibilities were to guard the construction site of a three-story industrial building that was in development. This was a super sweet job. All I had to do was be at the construction site between the hours of 7 p.m. and 3 a.m. I could sit in my truck the entire time, except for two different times that I was instructed to patrol the site. What I would do is get out of my truck and walk the perimeter of this site and then go inside and shine my flashlight around. This obviously wasn't a hard task, but it was a bit creepy. It was pitch black around this site at night and there were no working lights anywhere. Every time I patrolled, I was a bit creeped out, except for one evening where the creepiness turned into straight up terror. The night was going by normally. I was watching YouTube videos and listening to music in my truck. The clock hit 1 a.m. and I was due to complete my second patrol through the site. The first patrol went by completely normal and I had no reason to expect any different this time around. So I jumped out of the truck and started down the path that led around the site. I was shining my flashlight in front of me the whole time and saw nothing out of the ordinary. This trek around the site took the most time out of the patrol, and I'd say about 15 minutes after I began, I had circled all the way around and was back at my truck. At this time, I headed inside the building. My truck was parked in front of the building, and so I entered at the front door. The building was still being framed, and there were no doors installed anywhere, including the ones that led to the exterior. And that's the reason I was here, to make sure that nobody walked inside and stole any equipment or vandalized any part of it. As I walked inside, I heard something upstairs. It sounded like a shovel or something had fallen onto the floor. And so I hesitantly started up the stairs to investigate. I was a little bit spooked. What would I do if there was somebody up here messing around? I didn't have a gun or anything just some pepper spray that the owners gave me. I reached the top of the stairs on the second floor and I shined my flashlight around and didn't see anything suspicious. I walked around and eventually reached the front of the building and that's when I looked down to my truck through the recently installed window. There was somebody sitting in my truck. He was sitting on the driver's side seat with his legs still hanging out of the truck facing me. I was just about to turn around and head back down to confront him when he suddenly looked up at me and waved. At that moment, I turned around and ran back to the stairs. I walked down them quickly and ran out of the building. I ran over to my truck and the guy was no longer there. I got very nervous at this point and looked around with my flashlight. I saw nothing and decided to call my boss and let him know that there was a man here. As the phone was ringing, I searched my truck and saw that nothing was missing and everything was where I left it. My boss didn't answer and so I left a very short message stating, it's 1.22 a.m. and there is someone messing around the site and I have not located him yet. I shined my light around like a madman searching for this potentially dangerous person and thought it would be a better idea to get in my truck and drive slowly around the site. This didn't take long and I didn't see anyone. I circled back to the front and parked my truck in the same exact spot that I was in before. I put the truck in park and called my boss again. I got no answer and got out of the truck once again. I stood next to my driver's side door and again shined the light around. I didn't see anyone. Then, I shined the light up to the window that I had been at when I first noticed him and saw him standing in the same spot I was at, looking down at me. I realized my job was to stop people from messing around at this site, but this creeped me out so much, I got in my truck and waited until my boss eventually called back. He called the police and an officer showed up there about an hour later. He went inside the building and looked around, but never found the guy. 
I didn't see him again that night, or any other night I was there. I have no idea who he was, or why he was there. I left work late one night, later than usual. I was driving home when I unexpectedly ran into some construction going on, and I was forced to take a detour. I turned right onto a street I rarely ever drove on and haven't been on in years. The street took me into the downtown area of my city, and it wasn't a very nice place to be. Crime happened here all the time, and it made me nervous, especially because it was late and there were no other vehicles around. I stopped at a stop sign and apparently made a wrong turn because I looked around and noticed the detour signs were gone. I pulled my phone out of my jacket pocket sitting on the passenger seat in order to use GPS so I didn't get too lost and to guide me home. As I was navigating my phone, I heard a noise outside. I looked up from my phone to see what it was. As I looked around, I spotted a woman about 30 yards from my car, in the parking lot of a convenience store that was now closed. She was standing off by the corner of the store where it was much darker. Right after I saw her, I noticed that she looked scared, and then almost immediately I saw a man reach out from the side of the building she was standing next to, grab her by the arm, and pull her out of sight. The woman had made a noise again. This scared me to death, and I wasn't sure what to do. My first thought was that he might have been trying to rob her. I was about to dial 911 on my cell phone when I realized he might be trying to do something worse. I'm not the toughest guy in the world, and I've only been in a couple fights in my life, but I'll be damned if this woman was going to be raped or killed while I was right here. So I take a deep breath and opened my car door. After I did this, I heard the woman again. It sounded like she was half screaming, half calling for help, but all her noise sounded muffled like the man was covering her mouth. I walked around to the back of my car and started towards where she had disappeared out of sight. I walked fast, but tried to be as silent as possible. As I walked, her sounds were abruptly cut off, and I got scared. Scared of what I might see. Scared of what I might have to do. I reached the corner of the store and very slowly looked down into the dark side of the building. At first, I saw nothing, and so I moved closer, and that's when I saw them. I saw them both standing in the darkness, side by side, like statues. He wasn't touching her. She wasn't crying or screaming, and they weren't fighting. I realized quickly what was happening now. I immediately turned around and started a sprint back towards my car. As my feet hit the ground, I could hear that they were chasing me. I got to my car and threw the door open and got inside. I locked the door, and right after I did, they were both attempting to open the doors from both sides. I put my key in the ignition, started it, and stomped the pedal to the floor. I was so shaken up over what had just happened that I ran two stop signs right after. I drove home and never saw their faces up close. And you bet your ass, I haven't been down that street since. I know someone from my childhood who used to work as a chef. Let's call her Sarah. Sarah had to prepare a dinner party for a politician, but she and her workmates had run out of some ingredients, and since she drove a motorcycle, she offered to rush to a nearby store that was a few miles away. The house they were working for was settled on a hill. Aside from a few houses, 
there weren't any stores or establishments in the area. The road was empty. There was no one around. Sarah finished the errand and began to drive back. She was halfway on her journey when she felt a weight push against her back. Startled, she glanced at her rearview mirror and saw an unfamiliar woman with matted hair sitting in the back of her motorcycle, smiling and staring directly at her. Sarah was so shocked, she nearly lost control of her motorcycle. She concentrated as hard as she could and revved the accelerator as fast as it would go. She began cursing at the woman, telling her to get off the bike. As soon as Sarah could see the house in the distance, she heard the woman laugh, and suddenly her motorcycle felt lighter. She couldn't feel anything pressing up against her anymore. She dared to glance at her rearview mirror again, and thankfully, she saw no one. When she arrived at the house, she was trembling. She knew that she would sound delusional and possibly even gain a bad reputation at her job, but she told the people there about what she saw, and to her astonishment, a couple of the politician's security guards chuckled and told her that this was normal around here. Apparently, a few other motorists living in the area also endured the same encounter. My husband and I lived in a small two-floor house with two main entrances, one along the front and the other on the side of the house, which opens up into the laundry room. When we were too busy or it's too late to walk our dog, we hook his collar onto a long line that's attached to one of the pipes on the corner of our house so that he can use the bathroom. We used to do this from the door in our laundry room, but we had noticed the large step from the door to the ground had been taking a toll on his hips. As a result, we started letting him out through the front door instead, since the porch is much closer to the ground. This particular night, I was home alone with my dog, and it was around midnight when I decided to let him outside one last time before going to bed. I hook him up to his line, close the door, and lock it before heading into the kitchen to put away the dishes. This was pretty routine, even if he used the bathroom quickly. He liked to walk around along the front and side of the house for a few minutes before coming back inside. As I'm putting away the dishes, I hear a scratch on the door. That's what my dog does when he wants to come in, so I head over to let him back inside. Since I've watched way too many scary movies, I always look through the door's peephole before opening it. Out of habit, I look to check that my dog is in front of the door. Instead, I see a man staring very intently at the door handle. I freeze with my hand on the door handle. I don't know how much time went by, but then I heard another scratch. This one louder than the last. This kind of wakes me up from my initial shock, and I run to grab my cell phone. I call my husband to tell him what's happening. He was very confused. I probably wasn't explaining the situation very well, but he says that he's heading home. This is when I realize my dog is still outside with this person. I head back to the front door, trying to make as little noise as possible to check whether this stranger is still there. Just like before, he's standing there, head bowed, looking at the doorknob. I tiptoe over to the laundry room and slowly open the door as quietly as possible. I can't see my dog anywhere and the side of my house is covered in gravel. I knew I couldn't step outside without making a lot of noise. With my heart still pounding in my chest, I go to the front door to keep an eye on the stranger and to get a better look at him. I considered calling the police, but I didn't feel that they would take me seriously since all this man was doing was standing in front of my house. 
I tried taking a picture of him with my cell phone, but my camera was only able to take pictures of the peephole and not the images behind the glass. All of a sudden, the man looks up directly at me. I swear he knew I was there. He glares at me and then opens his mouth to show this taunting, malicious grin. He stood there that way for a few seconds, and with that, he turns around and starts to walk down the street. I stay in the same place, almost expecting him to rush back and start pounding on the door. Luckily, my husband got back after a few minutes. He convinced me to call the police, and we went out looking for our dog. It turns out that this man had cut the end of the line connected to the pipe, and our dog decided this was a good time for him to explore my neighbor's backyard, which was where we found him. It's been three years since this happened. We've since moved to a new house, and the police weren't able to come up with any suspects. Ever since then, we take our dog on very long walks before the sun goes down. I grew up in a really safe city in the Midwest, in an even safer neighborhood, sort of set back in the woods and separated from the main part of town. I haven't had a lot of creepy encounters in my short life, so this one is pretty much the most afraid I've ever been. I was 11 at the time and had only just passed my CPR babysitting essential course at the REC. My neighbourhood was very close-knit, all of the kids on my street played together, and because of my two younger brothers, I would soon become the automatic babysitter for the three families we lived closest to. I looked after my brothers for short amounts of time, but this was my first real job as a babysitter. I watched these two grade school age kids who lived across the street. They were family friends and the parents had promised that they would be home by 11pm and I knew that my parents were home and ready to step in if I needed anything. So I wasn't a little nervous but felt like I had things under control. These kids were a novice babysitter's dream. They'd been trained that they were only allowed to choose one treat each before bed and actually refused my offer to let them finish the show we were watching because it was their bedtime and they still needed to brush their teeth first. I was floored, but it made my job super easy. So I tucked them in and headed back downstairs to watch TV until their parents returned. The mother was an interior designer so their house was spacious and absolutely beautiful. Their living room is at the back of the house with floor to ceiling windows and is a great view of the woods into their backyard. The couch is set up so it backs onto these windows and I was watching TV with their elderly white Labrador, Alex. Suddenly though, out of the corner of my eye, I thought I saw something large and light coloured brush past the window behind me. I thought it might just be a deer, but I was 11 and alone and I have an active imagination. So I began to feel uneasy and pretty on edge. The parents weren't due back for another two hours, so I walked into the kitchen to call my mum and dad for reassurance. Alex followed. Their kitchen faces the living room with the house phones on the counter, as this was before cell phones happened. Standing at the counter dialing my parents, I had a clear view through the broad archways into the living room and out of those enormous windows into the backyard. Alex laid down at my feet as I stood next to the counter and told my mum that I thought I'd seen something out the window. Hearing her voice was comforting and reassuring 
as I thought it would be. So I told her that no, I didn't need dad to come over and that yes, I'd call for her if I needed anything at all. I hung up the phone and sat down on the floor to rub Alex's ears and belly for a few minutes. I was still kind of wary of the living room. I hadn't been there too long before I caught a glimpse of something odd outside those giant windows. I looked harder, past the glare of the TV, and noticed a tiny bobbing light moving around the woods. Probably just a neighbour I thought, but as I watched, the light seemed to be moving into what was undeniably my direction. My whole body froze, and I stared as the light as it got closer and closer to the living room windows. And at some point I realised that, complete with paralysing horror, the light had grown large enough for the source to be right outside the house. The beam swung from one side of the living room to the other, and then settled directly on my face. I don't even think I squinted into the bright light that shone through the window into my eyes. I was startled. Alex snoozed, placid in his old age, and entirely unaware that my heart had pretty much stopped beating. The light moved again, this time swinging away to illuminate a face from underneath. I saw dark hollow eye sockets and the glowing curves of someone's cheeks but the facial details were lost into the harsh angle of the flashlight beam. At this point I was trying with all my might to scream, or to move my fingers enough to dial 911, or move out of my view of the window, literally anything would have been better than sitting there with my mouth open and tears in my eyes like a stuffed turkey. But I'd never felt this kind of icy terror before. I was completely immobilised by it. Everything felt like it was moving in slow motion and I was totally powerless. The light swung around to point at me, then quickly moved back underneath to the horrible face outside. It repeated this pattern once or twice more, and then suddenly disappeared. The flashlight had been turned off and for whatever reason that was finally enough to let me move again. I quickly stood there and hit dial, about to call 911 as I mentally debated whether to get up there to the master bedroom with the children, or just grab them and try and run out the front door to my parents' house. The rec class had not prepared me for this. Before I even got as far as the foyer and dialed the first one, I heard a loud boom and felt my gut leap into my throat as I realised I remembered to close the main garage doors that locked the door from the garage to the laundry room but I couldn't remember locking the main doors from the garage to their backyard. I almost dropped the phone as someone began pounding on the interior door. Through the pounding though, I could hear a voice. A really, really familiar voice. Mavis? Mavis? It's Dad. Let me in. I stumbled over completely numb and unlocked the door. My dad could hardly stand up. He was laughing so hard. Apparently my mum had sent him over anyway to check on me to make sure there was nothing to be afraid of. He had done a quick sweep of the woods in the backyard, with a flashlight under the assumption that mum had mentioned that he'd be coming over to me. He saw me through the window, and attempted to show me it was him by pointing at me, and then shining the light on his face, under his freaking face. He was unaware that the shadows made it impossible for me to tell who he was until he saw the colour drain from my face and realised that he'd just given me the scare of my life. He thought it was pretty funny. I didn't really agree. I really thought I was about to get all kinds of murdered. But I'm so glad. It was a false alarm. I worked as a night auditor at this semi-swanky hotel next to the airport. One night, I get a call from a lady in 204. 
she says that she was hearing arguing, loud banging and crying coming out of 206. I check the computer and no one has checked into that room due to maintenance issues. I'm a little bit confused. So I called my supervisor to see what she would have me do. And she tells me to call on site security and follow them up with a key. As we're approaching on the elevator, we can hear the crying. It's loud. My heart begins racing as we're near the door. So I hand the key to the security guard and the next five minutes seem to happen in slow motion. He opened the door and immediately flicks on the light. Keep in mind, we're only on the second floor and the only door was by me. And it was about 3 a.m. and there was no one around. As we enter, the shower is on and steam is coming out from under the door. There is only one lamp on in the room and it is very cold. There is a lady in a red lacy bra and panties, super red curly hair, curled up on the bed crying. She was facing away from us. As Frank approached her, he asked her if everything was okay. She sort of stopped crying and rolled over. When she did, a wave of horror came over me. She was very pale and covered in blood and was just staring behind us. That's when we realized that the shower had stopped and that the toilet door was open. There was a man about six foot five standing in the doorway. We turned around just in time to see the cops tase him and arrested him. I was so grateful that my supervisor called the cops as well. It turned out that he was a rapist who hides in hotel rooms, kidnaps women who stay there and decides to cut them open. The woman was okay, but to this day, I will never go to a hotel again. From May 2010 to May 2011, I worked as a security guard at a hydroelectric dam in Virginia. It was a fairly isolated location. If you needed an ambulance, you could expect at least a 20 minute wait. About a month after I was hired, one of the guys at the dam told me that most security guards out there will quit after a few days because they got so creeped out by being alone in the dam all night and he was glad that I was sticking to it. In truth, it could be very creepy. Sometimes at night whilst I was patrolling the basement levels of the dam itself, I would think about the fact that I was 50 feet below the water line on the low side and the only human being in about a mile and a half radius. Sometimes, I'd hear weird noises in the woods or catch a flash of a shadow whilst I was in the dam. It does take a lot to scare me though and I knew that I was either hearing critters in the woods or my mind was playing tricks on me. One night however, something happened that scared the living hell out of me. It was a little past 11 p.m and I was sitting in the guardhouse reading a book. Suddenly, I hear a tap at the door. What's creepy about the guardhouse at night though, is that you have a little lamp inside turned on. People could look through the window and see you quite clearly, but due to the glare off the glass, it made it difficult for you to see outside. When I heard the tap at the door, I thought it was a bug hitting the glass. It was so faint, and I knew that there weren't any contractors at the dam. I had the place to myself. The tap came once again, more insistent this time. I grabbed my flashlight and opened the door. 
there was no one there. I let the door slip from my hand and shut behind me. To my left, previously concealed by the door as I had opened it, was a huge man, at least 400 pounds, wearing a grey sweatshirt and grey sweatpants, and the sweatshirt was smeared with fresh blood. My heart started hammering, and my blood ran cold. I was so scared I could barely speak. As it turns out though, he was a local fisherman who had been fishing off the bridges over the trail race, and he was wondering why the power company hadn't started back pumping into the lake yet. Because they usually started a little before 11, and that's when he always drew in the big striped bass. He was smeared with blood because he'd already caught and gutted a couple, and wiped his hands on his shirt. He felt really bad when he realised that he'd approached me basically in the same way that a murderer in a horror movie would have. I am thankful to this day that I am an unarmed security guard, because if I'd have had a gun, I would have either shot him or accidentally shot myself whilst trying to shoot him. I am a Christian, I am a member in our church choir, and I was around 10 or 11 when this happened. In our church every Sunday morning, we have breakfast in the church quarters. It has a beautiful ocean view. The dining hall is on the front, and on the left hand side are the priest rooms and rooms for the other church people. Our meals were always prepared by this one cook. He was a great guy, or at least that's what I thought back then. His name was Al, and back then, he was in his late 30s or early 40s. The thing with Al was that everyone thought he was gay, or at least he pretended to be gay. The way he spoke, the way his mannerisms were, they all indicated that he was quite feminine. So no one suspected him in any way. One day, there was a fiesta in our neighbourhood, so people were everywhere. I enjoyed biking around the area, and today was one of the days where I found myself doing just that, and I was wandering around the back side of the church, and there he was. I was sitting in a chair watching me. He called me to come inside the church quarters. He was all alone, and I didn't ring any alarm bells in my head, because we never had any stranger danger classes here, and because I just thought he was a nice guy. Not to mention that nothing bad has ever happened here. He invited me in, and I was led to his room. I don't remember how or why I was inside, as this was 10 years ago, but what he did next is something I will never forget. He locked the door. I was scared and his happy tone then changed to a quite sinister one. He walked towards me slowly, like a predator making its way towards its prey. He laid me in bed, and touched my ten-year-old thigh up and down. I was starting to cry now, and I told him that I just wanted to go home as I didn't understand why he was touching me in this way. He asked me how much it would take to kiss me, Silent tears streamed down my face, and silent pleas to let me out. He did. He opened the door and we left. He sat me on the top of his lap for about 30 minutes, just nuzzling my ears on that chair for his entertainment. And then he let me go. Needless to say, I never went back to church. I really regret never telling my parents about it. I can't believe how stupid I was back then. A few years later, I was informed that he died in his sleep. At least he will never harm another girl's life again. In the 80s, my cousin was on a camping trip with his wife. 
It wasn't a busy day for camping, and according to my cousin, the ranger told them that they were the only ones camping there that night. Anyway, so it's getting late, and my cousin said he spots something across the lake. He thought it was a bear standing, so he grabs his binoculars. He said it wasn't a bear because it had a face, like a 70 year old man, and the fur was longer than that of a bear. He thought maybe it was someone in a suit. It disappeared quickly, whatever it was. He was spooked and wanted to leave the park immediately. His wife thought he was being ridiculous though, and just having an overactive imagination. She had bought a shotgun and insisted that they would be fine if anything happened. So that night everything is going fine until my cousin is awakened by footsteps. His wife is still asleep, but he doesn't want to wake her. He just tries to keep as still and as quiet as possible. A figure approaches the tent. My cousin said he was positioned so that his head was on the corner of the tent. The figure leans down and gently presses its hands around the corner of the tent. So the figure is basically putting its hand around my cousin's head. I don't remember how long he said it lasted, but this figure eventually left. My cousin said it smelt like mechanical things, like someone was working on a car, although he had no car. The next morning everything at the campsite was untouched, no problems at all. There wasn't any evidence that anyone had been there. He eventually went and researched the area and discovered that the camping area is supposedly a hotspot for Bigfoot and such. He firmly believes that he saw some kind of Sasquatch. When I was 17, I moved out of my parents house and began working as a carny. This required me to use my pickup to tow things around the country. One night, I was heading back to South Carolina and had stopped in Kentucky at a truck stop to use the restroom and to get a snack. It was around about 1 a.m. I parked on the side of the building, went inside, and I always got super sketched out stopping at night, just because I was a 17 year old girl. As I was walking out, I heard, hey baby, Damn, where are you going? He kept saying things like that until I was out of view. It was a tall, skinny dude walking out of the store behind me. I hustled to my truck and locked myself in. Now that should have been enough to get me out of there immediately. But being tired, I decided to sift through my phone before heading out again. Ten minutes passed after the cat calls and I see the same man emerge from a dumpster near where the semis parked. A car pulled up next to the dumpster just as he walked out, and what I saw next made my head spin. I couldn't believe what I had just witnessed. The back door of the car opened, and a little girl, maybe around 12 years old, got out. They were obviously not related, and she was panicking. He grabbed her by the hand, walked back behind the dumpster and towards the semis. Then the car took off. I was shaking so badly but I managed to find out where I was and I called the sheriff. He met me after 10 minutes and I told him exactly what I'd seen. However, he didn't seem too surprised. He said they'd look over the surveillance tapes and I made sure to include how exactly he cap called me so that they could know exactly which guy I was talking about. I left, and have no idea whatever came of it. The guy was probably long gone with the girl before the sheriff met me, but maybe, just maybe, I saved her from a life of being a sex slave. I lived in a handful of different apartment communities with my mother for the majority of my teenage years. Some better than others, and incidentally this occurred in the best of all of them. I was 16 at the time, and there were a group of girls around 10 years old, 
that liked to hang out and play volleyball together a lot. They hated me because they used to go around with another kid and throw water balloons at them whilst they were playing. In hindsight, this was pretty creepy in itself, but at the time, it was hilarious. Well, I'd probably be the last person they would ever visit, but one day whilst I was playing GTA in the middle of summer, they came knocking on my door. I was going to make a smart ass comment, but they looked pretty distressed. So I asked them what was wrong. They told me that there was a weird guy driving around near where they were hanging out and wanted me to come by. I was the oldest kid in the complex, so it made sense that they would come for me. We went and got my buddy who was 14 at the time and we went over there. Well, they were right. We got over there and there was this guy in an old truck still there watching us approach. I was pretty fearless. So I flipped him off and started throwing a football with my friend. The girls went back to playing volleyball and this is where things get absolutely crazy. After around 10 minutes, the guy gets out and starts walking towards all of us. We decide to get the hell out of there. So we run back towards my place. He follows. I tell everyone to book it and he starts running behind us. At this point, I decide I'm going to go get my mother's gun and scare this guy away. So he beat him back to my apartment and locked the door. I get the gun, unloaded, and go back outside to find that he's there waiting for us with a nasty look on his face. I look him dead in the eye and tell him to get the hell out of here and point the gun right at him. But he smiles, reaches into his belt and raises his own gun right back at me. It's at this point that I completely shit myself. I know I can't fire. I went completely numb just standing there, gun raised for what felt like years. When in hindsight, it was probably no more than 15 seconds. Neither of us said a word. After that eternity, he finally lowered his gun and walked away. We called the cops after and omitted the part about my gun, but they never found the guy. I have not pulled a gun on anyone after that. I was the neighborhood badass forever after the encounter though, but absolutely did not want the designation. I didn't sleep for weeks. I can still clearly see the barrel of that dude's gun staring me down. I felt like the smallest dude in the world for those 15 seconds. Okay, so I have a story that happened to me and my friends. To set the scene, we were on a Boy Scout camping slash shooting trip. There are about 30 of us. We were in a little cabin with windows on the front and back, as well as a front and back door and wooden tables all around the area. The adult cabin with the bathroom was around an eighth of a mile down a gravel road in the dark. There was obviously a buddy system because it was Boy Scouts. So it's around midnight and everyone had been telling scary stories, like normal camping trips. I had to go to the bathroom and ask my friend to come along. He said sure, and we got our knives and we went to the bathroom and we began our walk back. This was where it got scary. I felt an instinctual fear. I looked to my friend and he had the same look as me. We start to walk slightly faster and unfold our pocket knives. I then turn around and see it. It looked like a cat, but it was around six feet tall and on its hind legs, kind of hunched over. I freaked the heck out and started running. My friend sees it too and we sprint back to the cabin. It began making a moaning slash howling sound and followed us slowly. We pound on the door and the guys let us in. We tell them what we saw and they actually believed us. So we lock the front door and look at the back door. It had no lock. We pushed the table up against it and had a kid sit there with his knife for safety. We drew the blinds on all the windows that had them 
and one of them didn't even shut, and we just sat there with all the lights on. Then we see the eyes outside of the window with no blinds. We were all shitting ourselves, and then the thing slowly walked to the back door. We heard bumping against it, but then it left. But we still thought that we were going to die. No one slept. And when the adults came to wake us up, we told them and they laughed and said that we were making it up. Everyone in that cabin know it happened, even if they didn't believe us. It was mental. I lived in rural Massachusetts. To anyone who's familiar, that means miles of wood, with spaced out suburban areas in between. I was walking down my grandfather's logging trail, getting ready for his funeral. I'm also an avid mushroom collector, so I'm always walking, slowly, and staring at the ground. Friends hate me for it. So I get to this cool little white-capped mushroom, and stop to take a close-up picture of it. And that's when I heard it. The best way I can describe it, is if someone with a lot of flesh on his knuckles was punching a tree. Now I know what deer sound like when they stomp to protect their children, and I know what smashing antlers on trees sounds like. I've heard bears, fisher cats, moose, pretty much any animal in western Massachusetts that exists. So naturally I looked up, freaked the hell out. It was so rhythmic, thud, 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 and went on for minutes at the same pace. So being the curious person that I am, I let out a whistle that couldn't be mistaken for a bird. I'm looking in the direction of the thudding, and can see about 75 to 100 yards through my grandfather's well-trimmed trees, and see nothing. Right after my whistle, I hear a low, quick whistle back. My first thought is, oh it must be some logger arsehole scooping the land past the no trespassing gate. So I yell, hello, pretty much as loud as I can. Then whatever it was, ran away faster than I've ever heard a human being run. And using my experience with deer and dogs and moose and bears, I assess that it couldn't rationally be a four-legged creature. I know what they sound like running, and this was much closer to something bipedal. I'm 100% positive on that. What doesn't make sense, however, is that a two-legged creature that ran away from me faster than any two-legged creature I'd ever heard before. And it also sounded like it was at least 250 pounds. The steps were loud and frantic. A lot of people believe Bigfoot has a spiritual connection with the forest it remains in, and thus the creatures in it as well. I did not find it a coincidence that this happened on the day of my grandfather's funeral, and I ran all the way home. Over a decade ago, I went to the Amazon jungle, to a family of shamans who had lived on their ancestral ground going back a thousand years if not more. All firstborn males in the family followed the path of the Ayahuaceros and healers for their community. So I arrive, and since I'm not from the jungle, I am told that we must do a ceremony so the spirits of the jungle would welcome me safely. The ceremony consisted of lots of singing around a fire that was encircled by beautiful flowers and leaves that we had collected and arranged earlier. A cutting of the capi plant was present for this and held a special centre location in the bio mandala we had created. The people I stayed with viewed the capi plant as representative of Mother Earth, and thus viewed it with reverence. After what felt like hours, the man told me the ceremony was complete, and led me to my room located in a separate detached structure on the second floor. There were some windows in the room, and after a short while decided to go to sleep. I was awoken in the middle of the night by a cacophony of sounds. 
I was hearing various distinct animal sounds. Birds, roars, guttural bellows, screams, sounds that I had never heard before in my life. The thing about it is that the sounds were all so different. They were definitely not all the same species. They all had such vastly different sounds coming from many different locations. I was freaked out, but stayed silent and tried not to move. If I had to estimate, it really felt like over 15 different types of sounds being produced. Then the banging started. It felt like dozens of animals were smashing their bodies into the structure all around me. There was substantial weight being thrown into the outside walls whilst the animal cries were going off. I was terrified because the windows were open, but maintained still. I couldn't even move due to the fear of what was just slamming into the walls. So I prayed and prayed for protection and somehow fell asleep. And I awoke later in the night to a large cockroach crawling on me. The next morning I wake up safe, and no evidence on sight of anything having occurred hours ago. I ran into the healer that day, and he asked me how I slept. Not so well, I replied, and explained last night's occurrence. He laughed, and said it was just the jungle welcoming me. I stayed there for around 20 days, and it only happened to me on that first day and never again. I almost have a semi-existential crisis every time I dwell upon this. About 10 years ago, my family and I were up in the White Mountains of Arizona to cut down our Christmas tree. My dad was driving our truck with my grandpa in the front seat, and my mum and sister in the back seat. I was in the bed of the truck along with our family's German short-haired pointer. We were driving along a forest road, and all of a sudden my dog starts barking and growling. So I look to see what it is, thinking it's a bear or mountain lion. What I saw was a tall, dark figure walking parallel to the road, about 60 to 70 yards away. I yelled at my dad to stop the truck. When I told him I think I see the Bigfoot, he just laughed and continued to drive. When I looked back to get another look, the figure had changed direction and was walking away from the road. The last thing I ever saw was the thing's head disappearing down a hill. To this day, I still do not have any explanation for what I saw. And every time the situation comes up, my dad always makes me tell the story so he can just have a laugh at it. I was on a four-day canoeing trip with friends in a remote part of the southeastern United States, back when I was a young teen. We were up late, built a bonfire, and goofed off as young boys do. I'm sure we were making a lot of noise. Eventually the fire died down to coals, and we were just sitting around talking when we heard a distant high-pitched scream. It freaked us out for a little but eventually we forgot about it and just went back to talking. A while later, one of my friends pointed to the opposite banks of the river and says, Guys, what is that? We looked, and standing there in the trees was a huge silhouette of some figure watching us. It was faint, but it was illuminated by the full moon, and it was huge. We just kind of stared at it in shock for a moment before backing away. We went to get our friend's dad and some flashlights. He was intent on showing us there was nothing there. We got back to the spot, and it was still there. We shone our flashlights on it, but it wasn't enough to get a better look. But the thing's eyes shone red with the reflection of the flashlight. We watched it watching us for a bit and it walked along the embankment, then walked back and disappeared into the woods. That was more than a decade ago, and we rarely talk about it, and we were all pretty freaked out.
In freshman year of middle school, there was a once a week group therapy session with developmentally delayed kids that involved them doing some craft activity or playing with Legos or watching a movie as a group. It was half normal kids, half DD kids, and the normal kids could sign up for it. I signed up pretty much instantly as it meant an escape from history once a week. One of my best friends at the time had the same idea and it basically turned into a second lunch period for us. The whole thing was overseen by a therapist named Bruce and it was generally pretty laid back. Bruce was an overweight 50-ish balding guy with an attitude and general appearance of Santa Claus. He ran most of the school's extracurricular activities and was pretty much universally liked. The other important player in this school was a kid I'll call G. You know the stereotype of psychopaths being obsessed with animal torture as kids? Well, this was dead on G. He would regularly tell these long, excited stories during group time about how much fun he had last week tearing the leg off a squirrel that he caught in his live trap or other similar things. Most of us have sort of ignored him and it was just assumed that he would talk and make up gross stuff to get attention. So one week, we were playing with Play-Doh. Since it was a DD group, the huge tub of Play-Doh had long since assumed a uniform shade of turd brown and the general drive was to get people to build things and tell stories about them. Most people just built dinosaurs or threw clay at each other. G, for whatever reason, had a huge flat square slab laid out and was building four large pillars on the corner. He eventually put a roof on it, which wouldn't stay on due to the lack of interior supports. The normal kids would always leave a few minutes earlier as the group time ran into the start of next period and we would need to get to class. I was no different and walked out whilst Bruce and the other kids were smashing Play-Doh giggling and throwing chunks of turd dough back into the bin. I got to my next class and the teacher wasn't there. Nobody knew what was going on and about 10 minutes later she showed up looking frazzled and would not give us any other information other than something happened. Being sixth graders, we went nuts with speculation. A few hours later, I ran into a friend from the group who was visibly jumpy and disturbed. He wouldn't tell me why, other than mentioning that group therapy would be cancelled indefinitely. I kept prying for information and eventually got the story out of him. So during the cleanup, the Play-Doh had been compacted back into the tub and this involved lots of smashing Play-Doh sculptures. A bit that the DD kids greatly enjoyed at this point when they tried to smash other people's stuff. G's house was one of the last things to go. He smashed down two columns and let one of the other DD kids smash one of the others. And finally, dared Bruce to smash the last one really hard. The last one had a pocket knife in it. We never saw either Bruce or G ever again. It was 2001 and my friend and I were both 17 and driving back from a late movie to my house one night. I lived in a pretty rural area in Maine, about 20 minutes from the nearest town. As we were driving down the highway through the woods, we passed a median with a car sitting in it, facing in the oncoming direction, with all its lights turned off. Right after we drove past it, it flashed its lights, did a three-point turn, 
and began driving behind us. We giggled that, oh, it must be a gang initiation. We're going to get murdered. Because this was me, and that obviously was not happening. The turn off for my road was a few miles away, and this car stayed behind us the whole time. We made the left turn, and the car kept going down the highway. Phew. But 30 seconds later, we realised that the car must have backed up on the highway and made the turn after us. Now we were getting a little worried. There was still one more road to turn down before we got to my house, and this was way in the woods. And the car did the same thing, backed up and made the left after us, and now we were legit freaked. I had a long driveway, and the car followed us right into the driveway and almost up into my house, which had all the lights on because my mother was home. We ran into my house just in time to see the mystery car reverse back down the driveway and drive off. To this day, we still have no idea why the car was following us, if they thought that we were someone else, or if they actually had bad intentions and only changed their minds when they saw that my house lights were on. Since we only ever saw the front of the car, we never got a license plate, or any better description other than a blue car. The woods near where my father grew up have plenty of old abandoned houses scattered through them. I'm from the Hudson Valley, and anyone who lives around the area can confirm that the woods have old houses, or at the very least some foundations remaining within them. When he was younger, he and everyone else would basically climb up this mountain to an abandoned house. He said it had a lot of old black and white nudes, but a lot of kids would go up to smoke and hang out and things were smashed. Part of the trip up the mountain basically involved climbing up a cliff, just a flat rock surface that you had to scale. This was also his usual way down, so one night he went up alone, and was working his way down. Night was settling in, and he was lowering himself down to the drop, and he felt an odd presence, and glanced towards where he had just been standing. Basically, what he saw was a quick glance, because whatever it was just made him climb down the mountain and run home. He described it as very tall, lumbering above him and covered in hair. And it most certainly wasn't a bear. Whenever he tells this story, he always trembles just remembering it. When I was 10 years old, I had a really freaky thing happen to me at my house. I woke up in the middle of the night, really thirsty. It was around 1 in the morning, and the entire house was dark. I got out of bed and went downstairs to get a drink. Conveniently, my mother had just gotten up to do the same thing. We head downstairs to the kitchen for some water. And right when we got to the kitchen, a car randomly pulled into our driveway, and a man got out. My mother and I are standing in our kitchen, as we watch him very aggressively start coming towards our door. He was wearing a hoodie, and black gloves, really big burly dude. Right before he reached the door, my mum flipped on the light. Since the entire house was dark, he couldn't see us, but we could see him. The instant the light flipped on, he stopped, looked right at us, and ran back into his car and hauled us out of the driveway and down the road. We never saw the guy again, and I don't know if he was trying to break in or what he was planning to do, but I had nightmares about it for weeks. Scared the shit out of me.
I was staying in a cabin on the border of Pennsylvania and Maryland in the mountains. One day we were snowed in, and when you're snowed in up there you're stuck. Now there are plenty of bears and deer up there. We keep salt licks, corn, and all other kinds of stuff around. Not to hunt, but just to feed them. Well, I walk by the back window, which is over the underground garage, where we keep our snowmobiles and the four-wheelers. I see this big brownish looking thing in the woods, probably 50 feet away from the cabin, just sitting in the snow. I was shocked because I'd never really seen a bear there, but heard some stories about them being around. So I ran to get my mum and show her. As we walked back to the window, the damn thing stood up. And I don't mean like a bear, I mean big, tall man standing up. It just turned around and walked with a huge stride. It took off into the woods. We stood there shocked. What the hell was that? My uncle just casually says, Oh, that's Sasquatch. He's a celebrity around here. I don't know if he was just trying to make us feel better by diffusing the situation with comedy. But after that, I never went into those woods alone again. I spend a lot of time camping on the beach, in Yosemite, and all over California really. But one particular Friday night, my friends and I decided to camp in the woods near Hicks Road. It's a notorious road for fatal car accidents, squatters in abandoned homes, and the like. This is about our third time camping up there. The last few times we heard some freaky noises, but nothing awful. So we pitch a tent in a small clearing and plow through a Taco 12 pack before we crash out. I fell asleep no problem, and wake up to the sound of what seems like people arguing outside my tent. It was 4.30 in the morning, and I stand up slowly and peek out into the darkness, and see a massive black mass moving, looking through the other tent windows. I see there's probably close to six or seven of them, they are absolutely huge and lumbering. I sat down in complete and utter silence for around 45 minutes, whilst I heard those behemoths around the tent. They were so close I could hear them brushing the fabric. Eventually they left, and when the sun came up, I knew why they were there. We didn't eat the last taco. I still don't know what exactly happened or why. It took place a few years ago in 2013. I was home alone. Although my parents went out often and I usually stayed home by myself and played video games, I never really felt alone. My friend Thomas lived right next door and if you looked out my bedroom window, which was on the second floor, you could see right into his. It was awesome. We played video games together most of the time, and the night that it happened was no different. It was Saturday, and with my parents gone, I had planned to play video games all night. We were in the middle of a match when Thomas told me he would be right back. That was normal, of course, but after ten minutes, I stood up and looked out my window. Right then, I saw him walk back into his bedroom and put his headset back on. I asked him what took so long, and he said he thought he heard his back door open and close. I asked if his parents were home, and he said no, and that he was home alone too. We eventually went back to kicking some ass when, about 30 minutes later, I heard something downstairs. In my house. It was really late at this time, and Thomas said he was going to bed. I turned off my console too and walked out of my bedroom to go downstairs. I stopped halfway down the stairs. 
I could see the faint shadow of someone sitting in the chair in the living room. They were facing away from me. I was about to speak out, but then I realized it wasn't my mom or my dad. I went back up the stairs as slowly and silently as I possibly could, never taking my eyes off of the person. When I reached the top, I silently moved back into my bedroom a few feet away. I grabbed my cell phone and hit the green messaging icon on the screen. At that moment, I heard footsteps coming up the stairs. I was completely terrified and I didn't know what to do. I got in my bed and pulled the covers over my head, hoping and praying whoever it was would think nobody was home. I tried to lay as flat as possible and control my breathing. I heard nothing after that. I stayed under the covers without moving for a long time. I felt like someone was watching me. I eventually pulled my cell phone up and texted my parents. I didn't get the immediate response that I wanted, so I decided to text Thomas. I typed one word and then heard the hardwood floor in my bedroom creak. I froze. You have no idea how bad I wanted to look to see if someone was standing in my bedroom. But at the same time, I was too terrified to do it. I ended up laying there under the covers for at least an hour before finally getting a text. I was too scared to move, but a minute later I opened it. It was from Thomas. I felt all of the blood rush out of my face and I started to shake. The text read, Who is that in your bedroom? I ripped the covers off of my head out of pure adrenaline and fear. There was nobody there. <laughs>